Jayek, Minnow Gijget. I hope you're having a wonderful day and welcome back to our Braiding Sweetgrass series. We are on episode eight, uh, so about halfway through the book. Um, before I get started, I always like to smudge, but do whatever feels comfortable for you. Um, in my culture, we smudge. I'm indigenous, so I smudge. I make sure I have a full glass of water and um, a cup of tea or a glass of water um, close by. We wanna be present, so that means we don't wanna think about the grocery list or our to-do list or getting kids ready for school or any of that. We wanna be present in the moment without multitasking. As good as we are at that, ladies, let's stop that just for this session. Uh, so I smudge, get a glass of water, cup of tea. Uh, now let's just be present. Roll your shoulders back. Relax all of your muscles. Put your feet on the floor. Deep breath in and out. And now we're ready to go. As I'm getting ready for this, I just had a thought occur to me as I'm, as I'm just talking about being present with the moment. Um, how many of you have set your fire alarms off with your smudging? many times it's all right it means it's getting through it's all right uh, but make sure you open a window when you smudge um, so we're starting off um, this episode 8 on epiphany in the beans I love her titles um, and that is starting on page 121 so go ahead and get your books out it came to me while picking beans, the secret of happiness. I was hunting among the spiraling vines that envelop my teepees of pole beans, lifting the dark green leaves to find handfuls of pods, long and green, firm and furred with tender fuzz. I snapped them off where they hung in slender twosomes, bit into one, and tasted nothing but August distilled into pure, crisp beaniness. This summer abundance is destined for the freezer to emerge again in deep midwinter when the air tastes only of snow. By the time I finished searching through just one trellis, my basket was full. To go and empty it in the kitchen, I stepped between heavy squash vines and around tomato plants fallen under the weight of their fruit. They sprawled at the feet of the sunflowers, whose heads bowed with the weight of maturing seeds. Lifting my basket over the row of potatoes, I noticed an open furrow revealing a nest of red skin where the girls left off harvesting that morning. I kicked some soil over them so the sun wouldn't grain them up. They complain about garden chores, as kids are supposed to do, but once they start, they get caught up in the softness of the dirt and the smell of the day, and it is hours later when they come back into the house. Seeds for this basket of beans were poked into the ground by their fingers back in May. Seeing them plant and harvest makes me feel like a good mother, teaching them how to provide for themselves. Um, so for this, I kind of want to hear about your gardens. Do you garden at home? Uh, if you do, what do you grow? Do you, the kids participate if you don't have kids? Um, do neighbor kids or your nieces and nephews participate with you? Uh, we've always had a garden. You know, the typical, we'll do corn and squash and tomatoes and beans. Um, always sunflowers. And um, I've always taught my kids how to garden and I didn't realize that in, in doing that it taught them independence because they will know how to feed themselves. You know, what, what happens like with COVID with the, with the shutdown and not wanting to go to grocery stores, um, how many have been able to grow a garden of their own to sustain their bodies? It's hay fever season too, can you tell? Okay, moving on. We're on page 122. 
The seeds, though, we did not provide for ourselves. When Sky Woman buried her beloved daughter in the earth, the plants that are special gifts to the people sprang from her body. Tobacco grew from her head, from her hair, sweet grass. Her heart gave us the strawberry. From her breast grew corn, from her belly, the squash. And we see in her hands the long fingered clusters of beans. How do I show my girls I love them on a morning in June? I pick them wild strawberries. On a February afternoon, we build snowmen and then sit by the fire. In March, we make maple syrup. We pick violets in May and go swimming in July. On an August night, we lay out blankets and watch meteor showers. In November, that great teacher, the woodpile, comes into our lives. That's just the beginning. How do we show our children our love? Each in our own way by a shower of gifts and a heavy rain of lessons. <laughs> Maybe it was the smell of ripe tomatoes or the aerial singing or that certain slant of light on a yellow afternoon and the beans hanging thick around me. It just came to me in a wash of happiness that made me laugh out loud, startling the chickadees who were picking at the sunflowers, raining black and white holes on the ground. I knew it with a certainty as warm and clear as the September sunshine. The land loves us back. She loves us with beans and tomatoes, with roasting ears and blackberries and bird songs, by a shower of gifts and a heavy rain of lessons she provides for us and teaches us to provide for ourselves. That's what's good. That is what good mothers do. Now, as with all of Robin's chapters, this one also hit home to me. Um, I've had several of those moments and I hope that you have too. I would assume that everyone has where everything is just right and you have this overwhelming sense of gratitude. Uh, now I can only pinpoint two, maybe three times that has occurred to me in my life where I felt completely um, con contented. I, everything was going well. I felt gratitude. Uh, so much love for my kids and my family. Um, but then those lessons come. You know, you're never done with the lessons. Even um, uh, my mother passed away at a fairly young age. She was 68. And um, sh her lessons were still continuing clear to the end. She had a hard life, but she she really lived it with grace and gusto. A very independent woman who had her 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 failings, you know, like we all do. And even towards the end of her life, she was still reconciling with those lessons and um, the lessons of her parents. And so the lessons as ugly and hurtful and devastating that they can be, they're necessary for us, in my opinion, uh, to gather empathy, compassion, uh, to reach that next level of understanding, of consciousness, if you will. Um, none of us are exempt to these lessons okay um but i would like to know what you feel about that passage i've let you know my gatherings on it i would like to know yours so please drop them in the comments and we'll have a discussion okay so now we're moving back on i don't like to read it all because i want you to get this book and do the reading on your own but it's hard to have a conversation without reading it. So I'm just going to continue where I left off on page 122. 
I looked around at the garden and could feel her delight in giving us these beautiful raspberries, squash, basil, potatoes, asparagus, lettuce, kale and beets, broccoli, peppers, Brussels sprouts, carrots, dill, onions, leeks, spinach. It reminds me of my little girl's answer to, how much do I love you? This much with arms stretched wide, they replied. This is really why I made my daughters learn to garden, so they would always have a mother to love them long after I'm gone. The epiphany in the beans. I spend a lot of time thinking about our relationships with land, how we are given so much and what we might give back. I try to work through the equations and reciprocity and responsibility the whys and wherefores of building sustainable relationships with ecosystems. All in my head, but suddenly there was no intellectualizing, no rationalizing, just the pure sensation of baskets full of mother love. The ultimate reciprocity, loving and being loved in return. Now the plant scientist who sits at my desk and wears my clothes and sometimes borrows my car, she might cringe to hear me assert that a garden is a way that the land says, I love you. Isn't it supposed to be just a matter of increasing net primary productivity of the artificially selected domesticated genotypes, manipulating environmental conditions through the input of labor and materials to enhance yield? Adaptive culture behaviors that produce a nutritious diet and increases individual fitness are selected for. What's love got to do with it? If a garden thrives, it loves you? If a garden fails, do you attribute potato blight to a withdrawal of affection? Do unripe peppers signal a rift in the relationship? I have to explain things to her sometimes. Gardens are simultaneously a material and a spiritual undertaking. That's hard for scientists, so fully brainwashed by Cartesian's dualism to grasp, well, how would you know it's love and not just good soil? She asks, where's the evidence? What are the key elements for detecting loving behavior? That's easy. No one would doubt that I love my children and even a quantitative social, social psychologist would find no fault with my list of loving behaviors. Um, and then she goes on some, some bullet points there. We observe these behaviors between humans. We would say she loves that person. You might also observe these actions between a person and a bit of carefully tended ground and say she knows that garden. Why then, seeing this list, would you not make the leap to say that the garden loves her back? The exchange between plants and people has shaved the evolutionary history of both. Farms, orchards, and vineyards are stocked with species we have domesticated. Our appetite for their fruits leads us to, to till, prune, irrigate, fertilize and weed on their behalf. Perhaps they have domesticated us. Wild plants have changed to stand in well-behaved rows and wild humans have changed to settle alongside the fields and care for the plants. A kind of mutual taming. Um, so I'd like to know your thoughts on that and if you have experienced or Maybe you are a scientist or a more logical, I must have evidence type of human. Um, I wanna know what you think about that. Do you believe that a garden or nature or um, a field that you tend to could love you back? Um, I think it's pretty brilliant. But then you get into the, the logical things. Well, it's potato blight or the fungus, or you know, those the little worms that come in and decimate your tomato plants. Is that love or what is that? So um, I'm, I would be curious to know what you have to say about that as well. Okay, so I'm continuing on. I'm on page 125 now. 
My daughter Lyndon grows one of my favorite gardens in the world. She brings up all kinds of good things to eat from her thin mountain soil. Things I can only dream of, like tomatillos and chili. She makes compost and flowers, but the best part isn't the plants. It's that she phones me to chat while she works, or while she weeds. We water and we weed and harvest, vi visiting happily as we did when she was a girl, despite the 3,000 miles between us. Lyndon is immensely busy, and so I ask her why she gardens, given how much time it takes. She does it for the food and the satisfaction of hard work, yielding something so prolific, she says, and it makes her feel at home in a place to have her hands in the earth. I ask her, do you love your garden? Even though I already know the answer, but then I ask tentatively, do you feel that your garden loves you back? She's quiet for a minute. She's never glib about such things. I'm certain of it, she says. My garden takes care of me like my own mama. I can die happy. I once knew and loved a man who lived most of his life in the city. But when he was dragged off to the ocean or the woods, he seemed to enjoy it well enough, as long as he could find an, int an internet connection. He had lived in a lot of places, so I asked him where he found his greatest sense of place. He didn't understand the expression. I explained that I wanted to know where he felt most nurtured and supported. What is the place that you understand best? that you know best and knows you in return? Um, that's a very good question. And I think it's something that we should all pause and spend some time. Where is the place that you feel most nurtured and supported? Uh, for my answer, it's with my family, with my husband and my kids. Um, they're my whole life even though my daughter is far away she's in grad school and you know, i know i'm getting prepared for that moment when my son leaves as well um but it's home when we're all together and it doesn't matter where we are it's not at this address right here it's not at maybe a future home we have i don't know it's when we're all together that's my place my sanctuary my sanctuary is an overused term it's my place, my nurturing place. Uh, and unfortunately, it took some trauma to really realize that. I didn't need, um, you know, a stone and wood building to have that safe place. Uh, I just needed my family, those closest to me. And once I realized that, the rest was fairly smooth sailing. Uh, just knowing that I had that safe, nurturing support at home, in my heart, with my loved ones, the people that are my forever family. Uh, so I would like to know your thoughts on that. Where is your nurturing and supportive place? Now I'm going to um, continue on with this next section. Um, I debated whether leaving it out or not because this it gets to be personal um, and trigger warning it talks about suicide so if um, that bothers you just speed it up or you can skip this part um, but it drives I feel like it's gonna drive Robin's point home on connection with the land and having your nurturing supportive place Okay, and she's talking about the man we just brought up that um, likes to be where he has his internet. He didn't take long to answer. My car, he said, in my car, um, in reference to his nurturing place. It provides me with everything I need in just the way I like it. My favorite music, seat position, fully adjustable, automatic mirrors, two cup holders, I'm safe. And it always takes me where I want to go. Years later, he tried to kill himself in his car. He never grew a relationship with the land, choosing instead the splendid, the splendid 
isolation of technology. He was like one of those little withered seeds you find in the bottom of the seed packet, the one who never touched the earth. I wonder if much that ails our society stems from the fact that we have allowed ourselves to be cut off from that love, that love of and from the land. It is medicine for broken land and empty hearts. Larkin used to complain mightily about weeding, but now when she comes home, she asks if she can go dig potatoes. I see her on her knees, unearthing red skins and Yukon golds and singing to herself. Larkin is in graduate school now, studying food systems and working with urban gardeners, growing vegetables for the food pantry on land reclaimed from empty lots. At-risk youth do the planting and hoeing and harvesting. The kids are surprised that the food they harvest is free. They've had to pay for everything they've ever gotten before. They get fresh carrots straight from the ground with suspicion at first until they eat one. She is passing on the gift and the transformation is profound. Of course, much of what fills our mouths is taken forcibly from the earth. That form of taking does no honor to the farmer, to the plants, or to the disappearing soil. It's hard to recognize food that is mummified in plastic, bought and sold as a gift anymore. Everybody knows you can't buy love. In a garden, food arises from a partnership. If I don't pick rocks and pull weeds, I'm not fulfilling my end of the bargain. I can do these things with my handy opposable thumb and capacity to use tools to shovel manure, but I can no more create a tomato and, or embroider a trellis in beans that I can turn into gold. That is the plant's responsibility and their gift, animating the inanimate. Now there is a gift. People often ask me, what one thing I would recommend to restore relationship between land and people? My answer is almost always plant a garden. It's good for the health of the earth and it's good for the health of people. A garden is a nursery for nurturing connection, the soil for cultivation of practic practical reverence and its power goes far beyond the garden gate. Once you develop a relationship with a little patch of earth, it becomes a seed itself. Something essential happens in a vegetable garden. It's a place where you can't say, I love you out loud. You can say it in seeds and the land will reciprocate in beans. And that was all of that chapter, Epiphany and the Beans. And I thought that was absolutely beautiful. Um, I, I love that she closed this chapter on a good note. Um, suicide or taking one's life or even feeling that, that depressed that you feel that you have to is something that's very difficult to talk about, but it's something we should talk about um, because it's real. I, I myself, I'm gonna open up a little bit. I do suffer from PTSD and severe depression from uh, multiple childhood, adolescent, and adult traumas. Uh, there was about, after my mother passed, there was about two years that went by that I, and there was not one day that went by that I did not think of suicide. Um, it was something I fought, and I'm happy to say I don't have those thoughts anymore, but I think about it and I, um, I reflect on those times often. Number one, because I don't want to go through that again. Um, more than that, because I want to gather my lessons from that time so that I can heal. Um, of course, I'm in therapy. I'll probably always be in therapy. Um, and I've just had to learn little tricks to overcome and acknowledge when I'm having like a PTSD event or something like that. Um, but the connection to the earth, reconnecting with my roots, with my ancestors, 
is one of the main things that brought me back. Um, as a child, one of my safe places was my closet, completely alone, isolated, door closed, and I would color pictures on the walls on paper, you know, to make it very happy. That was my safe place, my nurturing place when I was a child. Um, now that I'm an adult, the garden is also a nurturing place for me, as well as my family. But that touch with Mother Earth, whenever I collect cedar as well, I always leave tobacco. Whenever I gather any medicines or even when I harvest, if we go hunting, we always leave tobacco. But that acknowledgement that sustenance for my body and my children's body comes from the earth and I'm connected. Something about putting your hands in the soil too does something when you're working the soil and planting something and taking care for it. Um, I wonder if there's been a study on it um, to see if it releases some kind of endorphins or something because um, it's very therapeutic. Anyway, that got deeper than I thought it would, um, which may be a good thing, but go ahead and drop your comments. Let's have a discussion. So now we're moving on to the chapter, The Three Sisters. And if you don't know what the three sisters are traditionally in Native American uh, culture, three sisters are uh, the basic planting method. Um, first you plant corn, like a week later, you plant beans around the corn stalk, and then about a week later, you plant squash. Uh, the corn provides strength for the beans to, to climb up, and the squash protects um, the roots by covering over and provide shade to the beans which like get a little bit cooler so they all it's a symbiotic relationship and the beans also give back nutrients to the corn because one is like nitrogen fulfilling the other one anyway it's um, the basis there's also um, for the northeastern natives we and I think a lot of native tribes use this now is we do the three sisters and then we surround the garden with sunflowers um so and some call that the four sisters i'm learning more about that now through my daughter um of the reason why the four sister but i love sunflowers so i'm totally excited about the four sisters anyway let's go ahead and do some reading Okay, we're on the Three Sisters, page 128. It should be them who tell this story. Corn leaves Russell with a signature sound, a papery conversation with each other and the breeze. On a hot day in July, when the corn can grow six inches in a single day, there is a squeak of internodes expanding, stretching the stem toward the light. Leaves escape their sheaths with drawn out creak, and sometimes, when all is still, you can hear the sudden pop of ruptured pith when the water filled cells become too large and turgid for the confines of the stem. These are the sounds of being, but they are not the voice. The beans must make a caressing sound, a tiny hiss as a soft-haired leader twines around the scabrous stem of corn. Surfaces, surfaces vibrate delicately against each other. Tendrils pulse as they cinch around the stem. Sometime, something only a nearby flea beetle could hear, but this is not the song of beans. I've lain among ripening pumpkins and heard creaking as the parasol leaves rock back and forth, tethered by their tendrils, wind lifting their edges and easing them down again. A microphone in the hollow of a swelling pumpkin would reveal the pop of seeds expanding and the rush of water filling succulent orange flesh. These are sounds, but not the story. Plants tell their stories, not by what they say, but by what they do. 
If you were a teacher but had no voice to speak, your knowledge, what if you had no language at all and yet there was something you needed to say? Wouldn't you dance it? Wouldn't you act it out? Wouldn't your every moment tell the story? In time, you would become so eloquent that just to gaze upon you would reveal it all. And it is, and so it is with these silent green lives. A sculpture is just a piece of rock with topography hammered out and chiseled in. But that piece of rock can open your heart in a way that makes you different from having seen it. It brings its message without a single word. Not everyone will get it though. The language of stone is difficult. Rock mumbles, but plants speak in tongue that every breathing thing can understand. Plants teach in a universal language, food. So here she's totally showing her kind of geekiness towards plant love that she has and her um, degree. So I thought this was fun to read. Um, you know, we all get excited about different things. Um, so it was just kind of cool to see that kind of geekiness come out, but I loved it. Okay, moving on. And she's going on to talk more about the three sisters now. Uh, for millennia from Mexico to Montana, women have mounded up the earth and laid these three seeds in the ground all in the in the same square foot of soil. When the colonists on the Massachusetts shore first saw indigenous gardens, they inferred that the savages did not know how to farm. To their minds, a garden meant straight rows of single species, not a three-dimensional sprawl of abundance. And yet, they ate their fill and asked for more and more again. <laughs> Once planted, in the May moist earth, the corn seed takes on water quickly. Its seed coats thin and its starchy contents, the endosperm drawing water into it. The moisture triggers enzymes under the skin that cleave the starch into sugars, fueling the growth of the corn embryo that is nestled in the point of the seed. Thus, corn is the first to emerge. I knew she'd get even more geeky about this. I love it. Um, a slender white spike that greens within hours of finding the light. A single leaf unfurls and then another. Corn is all alone at first while the others are getting ready. Drinking in soil water, the bean seed swells and bursts its speckled coat and sends its rooting deep down deep into the ground. Only after the root is secure does the stem bend to the shape of a hook and elbow its way above ground. Beans can take their time in finding the light because they are well provisioned. Their first leaves were already packaged in the two halves of the bean seed. This pair of fleshy leaves now breaks the soil surface, joins the corn, which is already six inches tall. Pumpkins and squash take their time. They are the slower sister. It may be weeks before the first stem pokes up still caught in their seed it's still caught in their seed coat until the leaves split it seems and breaks free i'm told that our ancestors would put the squash seed in a deerskin bag with a little water or urine a week before planting to try to hurry them along but each plant has its own pace and the sequence of their germination their birth order is important to their relationship and to the success of the crop the corn is the firstborn and grows straight and stiff. It is a stem with a lofty goal. Laddering upward, leaf by long ribbed leaf, it must grow tall quickly. Making a strong stem is, a, is the highest priority at first. It needs to be there for its younger sister, the bean. Beans put out a pair of heart-shaped leaves on just a stub of a stem, then another pair and another, all low to the ground. The bean focuses on leaf growth, while the corn concentrates on height. Just about the time that the corn is knee-high, the bean shoots, change its mind. 
as middle children are wont to do. Instead of making leaves, it extends itself into a long vine, a slender green string with a mission. In this teenage phase, hormones set the shoot tip into wandering, inscribing a circle in the air, a process known as circumnutation. Mm -hmm. The tip can travel a meter in a day, pirouetting in a loopy circle dance until it finds what it's looking for, a corn stem or some other vertical support. Touch receptors along the vine guide it to wrap itself around the corn into a graceful upward spiral. For now, it holds back on making leaves, giving itself over to embracing the corn, keeping pace with its height, with its height growth. Had the corn not started early, the bean vine would strangle it. But if the timing is right, the corn can easily carry the bean. Meanwhile, the squash, the late bloomer of the family, is steadily extending herself over the ground, moving away from the corn and beans, setting up broad lobed leaves like a stand of umbrellas waving at the ends of a hollow pet petioles. The leaves and vines are distinctly bristly, giving second thoughts to nibbling caterpillars. As the leaves grow wider, the shelter of the soil at the base of the corn and the beans, keeping moisture in and other plants out. Native people speak of this gardening style as the three sisters. There are many stories of how they came to be, but they all share the understanding of these plants as women, sisters. Some stories tell of a long winter when the people were dropping from hunger Three beautiful women came to their dwellings in a snowy night. One was tall, one was a tall woman dressed in all yellow with long flowing hair. The second wore green and the third was robed in orange. The three came inside to shelter by the fire. Food was scarce, but the visiting strangers were fed generously, sharing in the little that the people had left. In gratitude for their generosity, the three sisters reveal, revealed their true identities, corn, beans, and squash, and gave themselves to the people in a bundle of seeds so that they might never go hungry again. Okay, now I'm on page 132, about halfway down. You can tell they are sisters. One twines easily around the other, in relaxed embrace while the sweet baby sister lolls at their feet, close, but not too close. Cooperating, not competing. Seems to me I've seen this before in human families, in the interplay of sisters. After all, they are three girls, there are three girls in my family. The firstborn girl knows that she is clearly in charge, tall and direct, upright and efficient. She creates the template for everyone else to follow. That's the corn sister. There's not room for more than one corn woman in the same house. So the male sister is likely to adapt in a different way. This bean girl learns to be flexible, adaptable, to find a way around the dominant structure to get the light that she needs. The sweet baby sister is free to choose a different path as expectations have already been fulfilled. Well grounded, she has nothing to prove and finds her own way, a way that contributes to the good of the whole. Without the corn support, the beans would be an unruly tangle on the ground, vulnerable to bean hungry predators. It might seem as if she's taking a free ride in this garden, benefiting from the corn's height and the squash's shade but by the rule of reciprocity, none can take more than she gives. The corn takes care of making light available. The squash reduces weeds. What about the beans? To see her gift, you have to look underground. So here she goes on and does a much better job at explaining nitrogen than I could have. 
Uh, this is on page 133. Uh, but there is one thing they all need that is always in short supply, nitrogen. That nitrogen should be the factor that limits growth is an ecological paradox. Fully 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen gas. The problem is that most plants simply can't use atmospheric nitrogen. They need mineral nitrogen, nitrate or ammonium. The nitrogen in the atmosphere might as well be food locked away in full sight of a starving person. But there are always, there are ways to transform that nitrogen and one of the best ways is named beans. Beans are members of the legume family, which has the remarkable ability to take nitrogen from the atmosphere and turn it into usable nutrients, but they don't do it alone. My students often run to me with a handful of roots from a bean they've unearthed, with little white balls clinging to strands of root. Is this a disease, they ask? Is something wrong with these rocks or roots? In fact, I reply, there's something very right. These glistening nodules house the rhizobium bacteria, the nitrogen fixers. Rhizobium can only convert nitrogen under a, spe a special set of circumstances. Its catalytic enzymes will not work in the presence of oxygen, since an average handful of soil is more than 50% airspace. The rhizobium needs a refuge in order to do its work. So basically she's talking about this, this transfer of nitrogen into um, basically fertilizer for the corn and the squash. So that's how the beans, uh, the middle sister gives back. Okay, I'm continuing on page 134. The way of the three sisters reminds me of one of the basic teachings of our people. The most important thing each of us can know is our unique gift and how to use it in the world. Individuality is cherished and nurtured because in order for the whole to flourish, each of us has to be strong in who we are and carry our gifts with conviction so they can be shared with others. Being among the sisters provides a visible manifestation of what a community can become when its members understand and share their gifts. In reciprocity, we fill our spirits as well as our bellies. Now, this is an amazing um, paragraph to me. Um, I came from kind of a broken family and I don't wanna to put too much out there. Um, uh, I guess I should only say this. If we would have truly understood this lesson, if our parents and step parents had known this lesson and taught it to their children, my siblings, uh, our life would have been much easier. And, uh, we probably would have appreciated each other more. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. Um, but drop your comments, let me know your experiences and what you thought of that chapter. Um, I am grateful for the lessons because I believe I've, hopefully, I've taught it to my children um, to appreciate each other, their individualism, their independence and to love and cherish them at the same time even if they disagree uh, so i'm hoping my goal is to make sure they have that lesson so the trauma i had to go through they won't have to go through and then hopefully they'll be even better parents than i was because lord knows i have my failings um and how many families could have done so much better and had such a better, more co cohesive um, upbringing if they followed the three sister teachings? Okay, now I'm moving on to, I'm on page 138. 
um, there's a few things I want to cover here. In indigenous agriculture, the practice is to modify the plants to fit the land. Um, some of you may know, some of you may not know that corn is uh, the original GMO, genetically modified organism, um, by Native Americans. Our ancestors, so corn used to look like wheat, basically. Um, just a grain that grew. And then over time, Native Americans using pollination, the same techniques that are used today to pollinate and to um, get desirable traits to reproduce. So now you've got modern day corn, but in between, um, like I still plant strawberry corn. I should have brought one for an example, but you can Google it. Strawberry corn comes from my people, um, the Anishinaabe, so more Northeast, uh, but towards like south, the Southwest, the Diné, um, and cultures around there, they have the more thick corn, like a uh, Walpole Island corn. It's like, that's how you get hominy. Um, so you have all these different kinds of corn that um, Native Americans cultivated from a grain. It's really interesting, I guess, if you're into that sort of thing. But yeah, corn is the original GMO food. Uh, um, yeah, so let's continue on. So where are we at? Um, so as a result, there are many varieties of corn domesticated by our ancestors, all adapted to grow in many different places. Modern agriculture with its big engines and fossil fuels took the opposite approach. Modify the land to fit the plants, which are frighteningly similar clones. Once you know corn as a sister, it's hard to unknow it. But the long ranks of corn in the conventional field seems like a different being altogether. The relationships disappear and individuals are lost in anonymity. You can hardly recognize a beloved face lost in a uniformed crowd. These acres are beautiful in their own way, but after the companionship of a three sisters garden, I wonder if they're lonely. There must be millions of corn plants out there, standing shoulder to shoulder with no beans, no squash, and scarcely a weed in sight. These are my neighbor's fields, and I've seen the many passes with the tractor that produce such a clean field. Tank sprayers on the tractor have delivered applications of fertilizers. You can smell it in the spring as it drifts off the fields. A dose of ammonium nitrate substitutes for the partnership of a bean, and the tractors return with herbicides to suppress weeds in lieu of squash leaves. There were certainly bugs and weeds back when these valleys were three sisters gardens, and yet they flourished without insecticides, polycultures, Fields with many species of plants are less susceptible to pest outbreaks than monocultures. The diversity of plant forms provides habitats for a wide array of insects. Some, like cornworms and bean beetles and squash borers, are there with the intent of feeding on the crop. But the diversity of plants also creates habitat for insects who eat the crop eaters Predatory beetles and parasitic wasps coexist with the garden and keep the crop eaters under control. More than people are fed by this garden, but there is enough to go around. The three sisters offer us a new metaphor for an emerging relationship between indigenous knowledge and Western science, both of which are rooted in the earth. I think of the corn as a traditional ecological knowledge the physical and spiritual framework that can guide the curious being of science, which twines like a double helix. The squash creates the ethical habitat for coexistence and mutual flourishing. I envision a time when the intellectual monoculture of science will be replaced with a polyculture of com complementary knowledge, and so all may be fed. So now Robin goes on, she's having um, a dinner with her students and they've all brought um, 
dishes from their garden. They've all brought their gifts to this table, but they've not done it alone. They remind us that there is another partner in the symbiosis. She is sitting here at the table and across the valley in the farmhouse. She is the one who noticed the ways of each species and imagined how they might live together. Perhaps we should consider this a four sisters garden for the planter is also an essential partner. It is she who turns up the soil, she who scares away the crows, and she who pushes the seeds into the soil. We are the planters, the, one, the ones who clear the land, pull the weeds and pick the bugs. We save the seeds over winter and plant them again next spring. We are the midwives to their gifts. We cannot live without them but it's also true that they cannot live without us. Corn, beans, and squash are fully domesticated. They rely on us to create the conditions under which they can grow. We too are part of the reciprocity. They can't meet their responsibilities unless we meet ours. Of all the wise teachers who have come into my life, none are more eloquent than these who wordlessly in leaf and vine embody the knowledge of relationship. Alone, a bean is just a vine, squash an oversized leaf. Only when standing together with corn does a whole emerge which transcends the individual. The gifts of each are more fully expressed when they are nurtured together than alone. In ripe ears and swelling fruit, they cancel us that all gifts are multiplied in relationship. This is how the world keeps going. We're going to end there. Um, I loved ending on that note. Uh, if we can all work together, acknowledging each of our talents and each of our contributions and respecting that, that we all have each and even uh, important jobs for each individual. I think so many times jealousy gets into the mix and then it just throws everything off balance. I see it, I see it often in families and it was in my family as well where one sibling is really good at something so then jealousy comes into play instead of appreciating that person's talent and then having your own talent and being secure with who you are as a person so that you can appreciate the talents of the others what everyone can bring to the table because we aren't all the same um, but we are and can be better people with that proper nurturing and support. That nurturing and support that Robin opened up the chapter with, with her epiphany in the beans, that you need that nurturing and supportive place that is real, that isn't your car or your closet, that it's a place where you can be nurtured and support and in return, be a nurturer and a supporter. Anyway, that's what I got off uh, out of the last two chapters, and I would really love to hear your thoughts. I you listen to me speak all the time. I want to hear what you have to think and what you have to say. I'd love to hear your experiences and um, what you thought of these two chapters. And hopefully my hay fever will be better by next week. That would be great. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and leave you. Hope you have a wonderful week and we'll see you next Monday for episode nine. We're getting there. So have a great week. We'll see you soon. Chi miigwech. Bama pee. For every Indigenous Author Monday video that I put out, I am dedicating it to the One Shelf Project put on by Gadakana. Gadakana is an indigenous organization, a 501c3 nonprofit, tax deductible 
organization that provides books in their local libraries that are actually accurate, historically accurate, and by indigenous authors, both fiction and nonfiction. And their goal is to at least have a shelf dedicated to indigenous accurate information in their local libraries. They can only do this with help through donors and they need your help. I will put the link down here. So please check them out. The One Shelf Project, another organization near and dear to my heart. Gedakana.